next few weeks, I want to talk to you about living a life of faith and uh, what it means to live a life of faith. Uh, a faith life doesn't mean that we disregard anything around us or that we just kind of cast it off or, or that if we have sickness, we, we just reject it or we don't believe it's there because we have faith. But faith, it's a faith walk. It's a faith walk in times of good times and bad times, whether things are up or whether things are down. I've got to remain faithful to God in bad seasons as well as good seasons. Amen? And so, living by faith. We used to sing an old song, living by faith in Jesus above, trusting and, and confiding in His great love. And that's what it's about. It's about trusting God. And believing that even when bad things happen, it doesn't indicate that we have to be bad people, but it indicates that God wants to be there even when things are not good. And when things are going the wrong direction, I've still got to give God praise even in those kinds of times. So your mind, your mind, your brain, your thought patterns becomes your, your battlefield uh, to, the, to the arena of faith. And your mind becomes that battlefield. And that's the battle that you will, you will fight on. And some of you have fought, have fought in some bad seasons in this past two years. And uh, Sherry went through a battle with cancer. Ms. Sossman went through a battle with cancer. And, and uh, these have been a rough season. The, that's a big word when it's announced to anyone. Uh, at least two of you that are here this morning are here because that you have lost your, or, or you are here alone because you've lost your spouse due to this COVID. And we have lost people out of our congregation that has been rough. And it has been a difficult season that we have walked through. But we have not stopped walking. We have got to keep pursuing and keep pushing. Even when things don't look positive in our life, We've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep moving forward. I want to talk to you this morning about our faith and living by faith. And the question is, what is our faith? What, what is faith? And I'm going to take you to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. And I want to, I want to read the, this verse to you, a couple of verses here to you. And then I want to talk to you about trying to build your faith. And there are some things that you're going to have to reject out of your life if your faith is going to move to the pinnacle of high, uh, that God wants it to move to. You're going to have to reject some things that will come and try to introduce themselves into your life. You're going to have to do that. And so Paul is writing to, to the Hebrew church, and he said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so... When he said it is the substance of things hoped for this morning, things that are hoped for are without substance. When you hope for something, it's not yours. When you're hoping for it, you can't lay your hand on it and claim it and possess it because it is not yours. But when real faith reaches God, faith attaches itself to something that is real. I may not have it. When you get a hold of the faith of God, I'm talking about real faith faith in God. There's a difference in hope and faith. And sometimes people confuse between the two because they think if they hope for it that they're believing for it. But there's a big difference in hoping. We hope for a lot of things. But when real faith steps in and when real faith begins to lay hold to that, you're going to begin to find out that there's an evidence that will start coming. There will be a proof of, of, that, of that reality that will step into your life and you're going to begin to see that that reality is, is genuine and it will begin to back up the things which are not seen. I haven't seen it, but I'm beginning to see the evidence that it's real. Amen. I'm beginning to see that evidence. It is like the story that I've told you so many, many times. And I don't mean to bore you with the same story over, but it's a phenomenal story. I remember a number of years ago, this is probably... 35 years ago or so, Brother Hatfield, old pastor in, in uh, uh, Henderson, Kentucky, wonderful old fella, gone to be with the Lord now, and he had a lady in his church that had a horrible, horrible cancer, 
And it was a terrible cancer. And uh, I would go there to preach for them, and, and uh, it, was almost, uh, it was almost sickening to, to look at that cancer that was growing, and it was just devouring her face. It absolutely was just devouring her entire face. And, and her whole half of the face from the nose over through the ear was just a big mass grown out on the side of her face. And it would just run profusing and constantly in the service she's blotting it to try to stop the runnage that was coming out of it. And she endured that and she had that. Well, every service when they would, you know, back in those days, you thought you had to have a testimony service every time you went to church. And so every service she would get up and she would testify to God healing that cancer. And instead of it looking like it was healing, it was getting bigger all the time. It was getting bigger and, and looking, looking uh, more terrible every time that you saw her. And so Brother Hatfield called one day and he said, I want to know if you and Brother Gish can come over to the church tonight and we're going to have a meeting with this lady and said, we want her to hold on to her faith, but it is hurting the faith of other people when she gets up and testifies constantly that God has healed that and it's getting bigger and looking worse all the time. But what he didn't realize was she was seeing and feeling an evidence that he wasn't seeing and he wasn't feeling. So that night, we went over to, to be with him and to try to comfort the situation and try to make it a little easier to the lady. And so after church, he had told her, he said, uh, after church, we want to have just a short meeting and we'd like for you to be in it. She had no idea what it was all about. And so that night, she stood up like every other night that she had been doing for months and months and months and maybe even a couple of years as that horrible cancer kept growing and growing and growing. And the Spirit of God just fell upon her. And by faith, she began to say, I thank God for healing this cancer. I thank God for healing this cancer. And I'm standing there and I'm seeing this. And all of a sudden, just like an old rubber glove, it began to peel right up in here, right up around her, her temple. And it began to peel. And it just began to flop over. And right down it turned and fell on the floor, right beneath her on that hardwood floor. And you heard that thump as it hit that hardwood floor. And her face looked like the skin of a newborn baby. It was just like brand new, uh, brand new skin. Hallelujah. Give God a great big praise here this morning. Praise God. You see, faith sees what the eye can't see. And faith believes what the normal situations in life cannot believe. Faith goes beyond that. And when we can get a hold of the faith of God and begin to trust God, there are amazing things that can happen. Amazing things that can happen. We have situations here involved in our church right now that we need a great faith move from God in. Uh, we need God to touch Alexis. I mean, not just a little prayer meeting. We need God to begin to move in that. That when this is all over, they're going to be able to, she's going to be able to have a normal, productive life and live her life out. There are other things that we need a miracle from God for, and God is in the miracle working business. So God is saying that even though the things don't have substance that you're hoping for, you may not be able to look out and see it. You may not be able to touch it or to hold it or put it in the palm of your hand. Even though you can't, faith is saying the substance is becoming real to me because I've got a hold of it in the palm of my hand and I'm believing that God is going to do exceeding things beyond what I'm expecting. Give God praise in the house here this morning. Amen. So the Bible said in verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were made of things which were not seen. So he, he is saying, let me explain faith to you, Paul is saying. Let me tell you how faith works. Faith that comes from God, it was the same faith that began to frame worlds where there was no framework. And God began to enclose those borders and he began to put outlines upon them. <coughs> and when God created the things which were created, they were created from things that were not seen. Things that you could not lay your hand upon. Things that were not uh, there. They just were not there. And when God created 
the galaxy that we are in. And he put all of these planets ro rotating and revolving in the places that they are in. He put us exactly where we needed to be to have the right amount of gravitation that we would not flow off and swing off out into the outer space or that we would uh, get too close to the sun that we would burn up or too far away that we would freeze to death. God put everything, and here we are thousands of years down the road, and it's still flowing in absolute perfection, and nothing has ever gotten out of the way, because when faith does it, it works it perfectly. Hallelujah. <coughs> Amen. And so, by faith God brought substance out of things that was in his dream. The things that he imagined. Things that he saw in his spirit. And he began to speak. And he began to put the galaxies in their place throughout this universe. Here this morning, we believe in a creation. And we believe in a creation by a creator. That's faith. We believe that by faith. Some folks will say that's way too simple. Well, I'm going to tell you. It may take simple faith to believe that God stepped out of the emptiness of space and said, let there be light. But that's not near as much faith as it takes to believe that a creature come flowing out of the ocean and walked up and decided he'd be amphibious and then decided he'd be earthbound and then all of a sudden the gills fell off of his body and he turned into a human being. I would rather believe that a God from heaven, supreme, full of deity, full of power, could reach down and pick up a handful of dust, form it in the form of a man, breathe into his nostrils, it became a living soul. And that same God has gone into the heavens today to prepare a place for me that I could come to. And by faith, I believe in that. Hallelujah. <coughs> today, everything that we see, regardless of what it is, if it is, if it is visible, it was made from some, some other substance. It came from some other substance. But when God created, he made things out of nothing. If God can make something out of nothing in creating the universe that we're in today, and there was no such thing as grass, and God said, let the grass grow. There were no such thing as trees. But God said, trees are important because later I'm going to create a man. And without the trees, a man will not have the oxygen that he needs to be able to survive. I believe that God created all things out of nothing. If I believe that, I believe that the same God can reach into your body and maybe something that has been deteriorated away, maybe an eye that has gone blind because something has died, God can take nothing and God can make something where nothing exists because faith says, my God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that I can ask or anything that I can think. Give him praise here this morning. Hallelujah. I've got to be cautious. As I live in my life, I've got to be cautious. Who or what is framing my mindset? Who is framing my mindset? Who is developing my, my mental developments? Who am I allowing to speak into my life? You see, negative or positive mindsets comes from those things we allow ourselves to listen to. Amen. I'm not interested in all of your gossip. I'm not interested in all of your stories. I'm not interested in what all's going on around town and in our community. You know what I want to know? I want to know what God is doing. I want to hear from God. I don't have time for all this other mess. I don't have time for all that because what it does, it creates a negative faith. I don't have time for negative faith. I'm battling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm fighting against demonic forces and I'm trying to bring down the power of the darkness of this world that the light of God can shine more brilliantly. I want to see the power of God and I've got to restrict what I allow to speak into my mind because once it is spoken, it is there forever and forever and forever. And I've got to do what I can in order to hold on to the victory of God. Hallelujah. <coughs> Satan will come. And you know what he will do? He will never erase bad things out of your mind. He'll let you remember every hurt, every disappointment, every discouragement, every person who ever did anything wrong to you. He will allow you to remember every wrong that every person's ever committed that you've ever known. He'll keep all of that fresh into your mind, fresh into your memory. But when you go home today, in 30 minutes, if somebody asks you, 
What verses did the preacher preach? Most people can't even tell because Satan will rob that from you. It's the positive he doesn't want you to have. He wants you to be filled with negative influences. Romans 10, 17 said, now, so, so then faith comes by hearing <coughs> and hearing by the word of God. Positive faith, negative faith comes by hearing. Positive and negative faith. Give me my verse again. Positive and negative faith comes by hearing. Whatever you're listening to, whatever you're hearing, that's what's creating the faith that's in your life. If your faith is positive, it's because you're hearing the right voice, and that's the voice of the Word of God. If your faith is negative, it's because you're listening to the wrong voice. What are you allowing to speak into your spirit, to speak into your life? Amen. <coughs> we, we, tend, we tend to build opinions on things that we have heard. We tend to build our ideas about others on things we have heard. Our mindset is, will determine our destination of life. <coughs> Am I going to live happy? Am I going to live victorious? Am I going to live in defeat? Am I going to be pushed down and not be able to rise up to become what God wants me to become? I've got to refuse to accept all the things that are negative and contrary to the Word of God. If it is not God's Word, it is not wholesome. If it is not God's word, we can't build on it. We got to build on the faith of Jesus Christ and the things that he is speaking into our life. Give God a praise here this morning, will you? <coughs> Come on, we can do better than that. Amen. Our mind is the arena of faith. Our battles are lost or won in our mind. They're lost or won while they're in our thinking. That's where we walk out with a victory or we walk out in defeat. Battles are won or lost in the mind. The flesh, which is a carnal nature, is, uh, is a mindset that we have that opposes the Word of God. It opposes the things of God. Your flesh, your carnality, will try to lead you in directions away from God. I see it every day. I see it in our church. I see it in our church family. People that could have some of the greatest influence and be some of the greatest workers for God. They've allowed their mindset to become preoccupied and moved it into the wrong arena. And they're following that, and yet they want to believe that they're right with God at the same time. I'm here to tell you this morning, friend, we've got to walk in the Spirit. And to walk in the Spirit means that I'm making decisions for my life according to the Word of God. What does God say? <coughs> I'm hearing some of my friends say, we need to build our church different now. We've got to build our church from the outside. We've got to build the, the live stream. We've got to get people listening. We've got to have people doing this, people doing that. Listen, we can't replace the fact that God knew the answer when he said, forsake, forsake not the assembly. There's something important about getting together. There's something important about rubbing shoulder. We're two or three gather together in my name. There's something about seeing other people that's serving God, living for God, striving against the things of the flesh. We can't live our life in selfishness. We've got to come back to the basis of the Word of God. And I understand, I understand that we're in a different arena than we've ever been in before. But I also understand I'm not serving a different Word or a different God than what I was serving five years or 10 years, or 50 years ago. And I've got to be faithful to the same book. And what does God say inside of His Word? Amen. So the Scripture tells me that I've got to abstain from fleshly lust. And I'm, I can't indulge in those things because they are unnecessary battles in my soul. <coughs> and I've got to rebuke those things and cast those things out. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, Verse 11 and 12, verse 11 first. He said, dearly beloved, I beseech you. I beg you. I'm pleading with you, he's saying. I'm begging with you. As strangers and pilgrims abstain. What well, means to withdraw from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. We're all going to face these things. There's none of you, none of us, that are going to get away from, from the fleshly lusts 
the things that are in the world. All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. But he says you've got to withdraw from those things. What is distracting your attention from the things of God? What is it in your life that's distracting you from being all that God wants you to become? You see, my, my, my challenges are different from yours. I can't come to you and tell you what my weaknesses are and expect that to help you. You've got to find your own. And you've got to battle against your own. And those fleshly lusts, you've got to beat them down and you've got to destroy them. And you've got to put that under your feet and declare, greater is a God that's in me than the weaknesses that I was born with. <coughs> Amen? Are you here? Now, notice verse 12. Having your conversation honest among Gentiles, among the unsaved, have your, your conversation truthful, having your conversation sincere, that whereas or while uh, I, I speak against uh, you as evildoers, they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold or they shall see, glorify your God in the day of visitation. Somebody is watching your life. It may be your child, it may be your grandchild. Somebody's watching your life. Somebody is watching your faithfulness. Somebody sees when you throw your hands up and says, I can't make it. Somebody sees you when you go after the wrong thing instead of the right thing. Somebody is following you. Here this morning, it is easier. We've got young people coming up. A lot of these kids here that are coming up, uh, several of them around here this morning, several are not here. But for those that are here, they're going to face oppositions. They're going to face obstacles as they come along. And there'll be temptations, temptations to create addictive things. I found out that addictions are a lot easier to get involved in than they are to break. They're a lot easier to follow than they are to try to break them off once you get involved in those things. It is easier to abstain from an addiction than it is to get free from it. Never start it. Never get involved with it. I, I admire people when they can say, I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. I've never had... Uh, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I admire that person. Because I see people every day that are battling and struggling. Battling and struggling with those addictions that they're having trouble breaking off of their life. Because they simply got, got in with the crowd and started doing the wrong thing. Here this morning, friend, we need to get a hold of God. We need to get into this battle with God. And we've got to guard our thought life. And we've got to block thoughts that are against the Word of God. If God didn't say it, we've got to come back to the basis of the book. In today's world, there's extreme pressure to abandon uh, the, the, the validity of the Word of God, to get away from the teaching of the Word of God. I mentioned to Sheila just recently. I am, uh, for some reason, it seems that more and more and more often, you're hearing people now, like on the news, referring to God, referring to the things of God. This morning, I was, there was, I was reading and I just heard a lady on the, on the news or on the TV or something and they were talking about somebody rescuing animals. And the newscaster made this statement. She said, you know what this makes me think of? And she said, what? She said, it makes me think of Noah. It makes me think of the Bible. And she said, you know what? You're doing a biblical thing. You're saving the lives of these animals. That made me feel good. Not that I thought she necessarily was following the Bible by doing that, although there's a good thing. Amen. But it made me feel good that she would refer to the fact out and openly on open market that you are following the Bible. There's something truth about the Word of God that even the atheists believe and know that there's something infallible about it. Let me tell you this morning, God has never missed a trick in the past. He has never missed a word in the future. And everything that God has said will work. And if you'll follow the pattern of God, it will work for you. That's called faith. Many people fall away from faith and they give in to pressure to conform to the world's belief system and to the world's values. You can't give in. You can't crumble. You can't fall away. Let me read to you Hebrews 12, chapter 12, verse 1. 
Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight, the thing that's weighting you down, the thing that's burdening you. Lay aside that weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Let's look at that verse here this morning. What is it in your life that's weighting you down? What is it that's keeping you from moving to the elevation that God wants you to move into? What is it that's keeping you from climbing up to that extra dimension in God? What is it that is keeping you from making that full commitment, full dedication, full surrenderance over to the kingdom of God? And what God is saying to us here is this. Whatever it is, it's become a burden to you. And your burden may not be the same as mine. And your burden may not be the same as somebody else's. You have to identify it in your own life. And you have to begin to lay aside that. You say, well, that's important to me. Well, faith says, I have one important thing, and that I must please God. Faith says, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to spend eternity separate from God. And he said, you got to watch out for the sin that does so easily beset us. That means, the word beset means overcomes you or plagues you. What is your sin that causes you constant torment? What is the sin that causes you to constantly fall short of the glory of God? Faith says we got to take that away. we got to rebuke that out of our life. and we got to walk with God. <coughs> we got to feel what God has for our life. The most severe battle in life that you're going to have is when you reach the place. And I'm coming to a close in just a couple of minutes. But when you come to the place in your life that you finally arrive to where you understand, I've reached the point that only God can bring me out. I'm, I'm here, I, I'm, at, I'm at the spot that there's no, uh, no other help that I can have. Only God is able to bring me out. When you get to that place to where you know that there is nothing but God and you've got to entirely depend upon God, there's no one else to whom you can turn. There's no one else to whom you can, you can seek refuge. It's only in Him. Only in Him. That's when you've got to understand. That's what you've got to understand. That I'm in a battle that I've got to turn my faith over to God. And when you get to that place that your back is against the wall, when you get to that place, Sherry's family are battling with Alexis. It's a battle to all of us, or should be. I, I, I can't wake up in the night without that being the first thought of my mind. Been, I've been tormented by that thing with that child. And that's the way it should be. But when you get to the point that you realize there's nothing else but God, I can, I can let the doctors do what they can. I, I can let them try whatever they can try, and I can pray that God will, will help through what they're doing. But ultimately, I've arrived to a point that this is Jesus only, and there's nothing else on this hillside but just me and Him. No, no, nothing else. It's at those times you've got to say, God, I know you're not going to leave me. There are times I might feel all alone, but you've already promised me you wouldn't walk away from me. You've already promised me you wouldn't turn your back on me. You promised me that you'd never leave me, never forsake me. It's at those times I've got to stay daily in prayer and supplication and seeking the face of God. It's at those times I've got to guard my surroundings. What am I going to allow to come into my life? What am I going to allow to, 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 to take hold in my spirit and in my life? I've got to guard my surroundings and that means I've got to guard myself from people that are around me. I've got to guard myself. When I was battling, when I was battling severe cancer, I didn't want to be around everybody talking about everything. I didn't want to hear conversations. I had a tape recording of scripture verses that read over and over and over and over. 
And I listened to those day and night, same verses over and over and over and over. I went to bed with them playing on, 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 on rerun play that they would just continue to play, uh, to play for me. Verses, by His stripes I am healed. Verses, I am the Lord your God that healeth thee. And I let those verses play day and night, day and night, day and night. Because I knew I got to guard myself from my surroundings and that means the influences of people. I couldn't allow the enemy to steal my rest or to steal my joy. I had to keep my joy because the joy of the Lord was to be my strength in the weak moments of my life. When everything was going bad, I still had to have my joy. And I had to give all glory to God. God, I thank you this morning. I thank you this morning. This is the day you've given us and I'm thanking you for it. As we all stand this morning, I am worshiping you right now, God, and I'm eternally grateful. (coughs) I'm eternally grateful for what the Spirit of the living God has done in my spirit and what you're capable of doing and what you have promised to do. Oh, Lord God, move and flow with the abundance of your glory. May your power speak great peace and great life into our spirit here today. Those that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, let them understand they are not building their tents here. They're passing through. They're not stopping. They're moving. I'm not making my bed among the wicked. I'm rising up to the righteousness, to the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Healing is flowing in this building today. The power of faith is speaking in this building here this morning. And God is trying to reach into your spirit and pull you to a higher dimension than you have been at in a long, long time. He is trying to take you to a certain pinnacle of praise, a certain position of worship, to a place where you are exceedingly filled with the joy of God, where you may meditate upon His law both day and night. The church is walking into a moment of victory that we have not seen before. The church is walking into a moment of climax where the Spirit of the living God is going to exceedingly move in dimensions that we have not seen the liking of in many, many years if we have ever seen it even before. The spirit of darkness vaguely fades away as the spirit of life rises. The spirit of life is light and the light arises to a new dimension, to a new day. And we're coming forth right now to that new day. And as the Spirit of God would speak into our hearts and into our spirits, God is saying, come up higher. Come up higher. And I will show you things that will come, not only today, but in our tomorrows to come. Across this building, as we are praying and worshiping God, I want you to know right now, that it's time for you and your family to pray. It's time for you and your family to be at these altars worshiping, surrendering to God, turning over to God. And I'm asking you now to come. God, bring us to that new height of glory. Bring us to that new position, new dimension, a new horizon, a new day. Oh God, life, abundant life, abundant life, abundant life from an abundant God. Oh God, the Lord is speaking into your spirit here this morning and he's bidding you even so to come. And I'm asking you to come.
Anyone else want to come? Anyone else? I don't understand. I don't understand. We all need a closer walk with God. We all need to move up to heights in God we've not come to before. Oh God. God, God, I need you today. Like never before, I need you today. Oh, yes.